Hello everyone. Uh, so I'm uh, Bogdan from Crater and my role in Crater is pretty much everything. <laughs> so I, let's say I'm TD and uh, in in last couple of months I was working uh, actively on uh, trying to implement a whole USD pipeline in our studio and what you will see is work in progress. So it's not uh, it's it it is uh, the current state where we, where we are okay so i'm not going to play craters real because i have uh, only 35 minutes uh, okay so let's yes yeah, so let's define some terms so uh, does everyone uh, does everyone of you know uh, what is outliner or scene hierarchy I suppose yes. So e every program except maybe 3D Studio Max, but even Max has it now. So uh, in every program there is scene hierarchy. So there is like a root of the scene, groups and uh, parents and uh, children. And uh, in Houdini uh, you can kind of see scene hierarchy, but uh, when we work uh, when we work in SOPs, when we do, for example, some kind of di destruction or, or something like that, we prefer to to keep everything uh, at the same level and uh, this path attribute that you see is what is the hierarchy that we inherited from Maya and that is very important from Maya or any other program. Uh, that thing is very import important to keep and if we export something back to Maya we need to keep these paths and uh, we had a lot of trouble when people don't uh, do that. Okay. And this would be like a typical uh, uh, pipeline uh, in uh, in production. So we have asset uh, modeling, rigging, animation, FX, light, uh, look dev, and comp. And between these steps, uh, what we do, we transfer some data, and we use uh, some of the formats, and mostly we use Alembics. Uh, if we, if we work with uh, Unreal, we use uh, FBX a lot and a little bit we use the obj and basically none of these formats support uh, uh, transferring shaders except fbx and what fbx supports is very limited so uh, you cannot transfer some complex shaders and um, yeah so for shaders what we use is material x uh, or ASS archives because we are Arnold based studios so we can transfer shaders between uh, scenes between apps with ASS archives actually and if you work in Redshift, V-Ray or any other renderer there is like equivalent uh, equivalent format uh, for example Redshift proxy or V-Ray proxy with which you can do that so this graph now looks like this. So a bunch of data is transferred uh, through Alembics. Um, f between rig and animation, we actually reference scene. Everyone uh, does that. And uh, if you look, for example, from FX, uh, when you transfer stuff to, to light, and traditionally, uh, for long, uh, for long time, we were studio that was rendering everything in Maya and Arnold. And uh, whenever we had situation in which we had uh, to transfer stuff from FX, from Houdini or RealFlow back to Maya, it was always pain. Uh, it was, for example, uh, we even used RealFlow plugins to transfer particles from Houdini to, to Maya. Now Alembics uh, can kind of do it, but uh, in the end, what we usually did, because we are using Arnold I in both apps, uh, we were exporting uh, all FX caches uh, except volumes as Arnold archives, and that worked. And then at some point, what we realized, okay, let's turn uh, let's turn the story around. So uh, why should why would we uh, from Maya we get animations and characters? So let's render everything in Houdini because we were getting projects that were uh, FX uh, heavier and heavier in terms of FX. So basically, uh, we just switched sides and we all we used uh, Alembic, uh, ASS archives uh, for that as well. So on the right, you can see what are the benefits that these archives give you. So for example, uh, you can transfer shaders, you can transfer hair, fur, you can transfer a lot more data 
and uh, they have only one uh, pretty big fault, and that is their black box. So what you get in your scene looks like this, and your scene looks uh, your scene is usually a bunch of boxes, and you have to press render in order in order to see what is inside your scene. You can expose polygons uh, on these archives, but usually uh, Houdini will crash, Maya will crash also, or if you export uh, archives from uh, Houdini to Maya, if you use instancing, uh, instances will be all over the place, so it's very unpredictable. And you can see, for example, uh, what what we usually did is, for example, we always have proxy and, we all, and uh, render archive, and for example, for this, this is from one uh, currently going project. Uh, I found what is uh, the name of the archive. It was Br Brazilland 3 uh, version 3. And I found the Lambic for the proxy with the same name. It was not the same tree. So some artists messed it. So, and, and these things, if you, don't, uh, if you don't keep it tight, if you don't have like a couple of TDs that would create scripts with which people would export, for example, two of these things, and like good version control, it would fall apart. And we were witnessing many projects, uh, things were falling apart because of that. And yeah, so I have one practical example of the project uh, in which we used like traditional system uh, for the for yeah whole uh, pipeline. So some of you have seen this yesterday. So I might uh, I might uh, just skip to the next slide at some point. So this is uh, one uh, Bollywood film in which we did more than 60 shots, uh, and most of the shots had uh, uh, water and fire, or one of these. Uh, so uh, for this project, our our approach was okay. Uh, we are uh, we tried to render water in Arnold. And basically, we realized uh, yesterday, I was speaking about how we realized that uh, displacement maps for water would take uh, more storage than we have. So in the end, what we decided is to render this uh, ship in Arnold, to render uh, this, all of these volumetric effects on the ship with Arnold. It was b better. And uh, to render... Um, to render actual water surface and the white water in uh, mantra and what that means when you when you make that kind of decision that means uh, you have to have assets in arnold and assets in mantra you have to have two sets of shaders you have to have two sets of lights that means that you as a td have to you know create uh, everything in a way that artists could not break it okay and this is uh, this is uh, so our uh, our uh, decision was to render it of course in houdini because of uh, water and it was also animated in houdini what i wanted is that animators would control the waves through houdini wave tools ocean spectrums and so on so uh, it was not so tough for them to animate in houdini actually uh, so uh, this is uh, so this was the first step of conversion of the asset to to, Houd to Houdini. So basically, we use Material X for materials, and basically you can export materials as that uh, Material X file, assign it to objects, and it works. Uh, bad side of that is that you cannot easily edit these materials. You have to use operators. In order to use operators, operators, uh, you need to, you know, there is syntax for that. You need to go to the doc documentation. It's not very well documented, and uh, at some, uh, in some projects, I even ha have to use had to use a Python uh, Arnold Python API in order to modify some stuff in archives, and it's pain, and it's pain for the artist is is hell. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, and the other step, uh, so for the materials, okay, we are not going to edit them too much. Maybe we'll have two sets of materials. We had four sets in the end. Uh, for the lights, 
it was a bigger problem because we wanted to have these lights in, in scene. And there is no way uh, up to now uh, to transfer lights between applications. And basically what we had to do is uh, we had to create uh, four scripts. One script to convert uh, lights uh, from Maya to Houdini, Arnold lights, and then other script to convert these Arnold lights to mantra lights, and then you face, like, there is uh, some multiplier between the intensities. There are some parameters work uh, differently in, in mantra. So we had to test it to, to match it. And in the end, yeah, so you can see these scripts. I said four scripts, but there is two I can remember. <laughs> Okay, so there is, it's like converting stuff to JSON, then uh, importing uh, and recreating objects uh, in, in Houdini. So it's not that difficult and it worked. Uh, okay, so in the end, this was the final asset. Okay. And then uh, what we usually do in Houdini is we wrap uh, all of this stuff in digital asset. So what artists, uh, what light artists had in the end was this kind of parameters in which they would choose what is the version of the animation they can use. Uh, if there is destruction in this shot, so it would basically, script would scan to the folders and say if there is destruction then populate this uh, menu and uh, artists could choose version of destruction and they could choose uh, some uh, uh, looks, so different sets of shaders uh, in, in, uh, for destruction. Okay, and as you can see, uh, there is that middle step that is FX, uh, in which, for example, we had uh, a con animation of containers, which we did uh, either by hand or uh, through rigid body simulations. So basically, that step would modify animation alembic and then that alembic goes to light and uh, there is one problem uh, with this uh, with this system and that problem uh, is basically Houdini the way Houdini interprets uh, alembics or any kind of uh, hierarchy is basically uh, yeah in Houdini when you can uh, what you saw basically uh, I was selecting one group but basically you are always selecting last uh, shapes in the hierarchy and there is no easy way to target only group like in Maya, take a group and transform it. In Houdini up to now there was no easy way to do it. Uh, so basically if any shape changes name in, the, in, in this ship or any group changes name or uh, there is new shapes, I would have to go through all animation scenes uh, and uh, re-export animations again. So that's something that you do, for example, with the characters. If skin changes, if there is one uh, vertice added, you need to basically update all of your caches. But this is mechanical asset. So why should we do that? It's, uh, that question was bothering me at the time. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, in, in Houdini, there is other way how to approach it, uh, you have kind of outliner, you have a lambic hierarchy, but uh, I think nobody uses that because it's uh, all the benefits that you get from Houdini, like having everything in one sub uh, level, you lose it. So you have to do a lot of, uh, a lot of transferring back and forth. So yeah, back at, and project, uh, so, Everything kind of worked, uh, and we we were delivering shots. But in the end, in all shots, uh, our assets uh, there is some exception in the shots. So all all of our assets uh, eventually get unlocked and edited per shot. So that means that uh, we don't have good system, or we don't have time. Uh, so. Uh, other project uh, on which we worked uh, last uh, spring is Moon Knight and that project we got like uh, we got in that project in last three months of the project and we got a bunch of uh, a bunch of assets from uh, some uh, major companies and these were the lights we got so <laughs> a bunch of locators with attributes so uh, our question was okay what to do with that uh, create lights in these spots and match what we what we gave you 
the look. Uh, we got some attributes on these locators, but basically our uh, partners uh, in on this project, uh, uh, FX3X, uh, they were doing the lights, we were doing uh, the shaders, so this is what we got for the shaders, so it's a bunch of textures, and for the, for the shading itself, they say, figure it out, okay, you have a bunch of uh, references, so figure it out, that was the easy part. So there were some. There are there are some people here who, who worked on on that, and for the lights, our uh, our uh, CEO Peter, who is not here, uh, basically uh, he was uh, he took these 200 lights and uh, these renders and matched it in a couple of days. And there is other guy here, also Peter, who did the other environment so eventually we did it but it was uh, it was a couple of nights of uh, creating scripts in order to to convert uh, this stuff and we had uh, almost 70 shots on this project uh, everything was changing everything was fluid and uh, because uh, other vendor was working in maya we decided also to work in maya and uh, what i noticed for example uh, just opening seven, 70 scenes and doing one simple thing, thing could take like whole, whole uh, evening or uh, half a day. So that's really not practical. Uh, there are some uh, there are some ways how uh, to interface, how how to copy parameters, copy render layers, and so on. But there were some things that were not working, and I was constantly having to create some kind of uh, patch scripts in order to help artists uh, do their job and back at the time I was thinking okay there must be a better way to do it because we have same environment we have uh, like just different cameras uh, light is not changing that much between the shots so it would be more practical to do it in one scene actually okay but uh, yeah there must be a better way to do it so uh, back at the time I was like watching uh, w what was happening in Solaris uh, with one eye but uh, Jeff Wagner said okay don't do it too fast like uh, we are working on it so don't uh, don't rush into it so we followed that advice and we had uh, after these two projects we had like a wish list uh, what do we want for the assets for example we want to have high poly and low poly geometry and as you saw today on uh, autodesk presentations you can for example create proxy and uh, and render time geometry and in your scene you don't see these boxes you actually see some geometry maybe it's not high res uh, you want materials, of course, you want lights, and you want uh, variations in your assets. So, for example, you want to have damage levels, you want to have, uh, like, for the characters, different looks or something like that. So, ideally, you want to have everything packed in one file, and uh, you as a TD don't have to do anything about it. Uh, artists would pack it up, and that's it. So. Uh, this is one uh, project that we are currently working on. It's our in-house project, and this is uh, this is like showcase how uh, how does it function. So this is uh, one asset for the project, and this is rendered in Karma. Actually, I uh, converted it to Karma two days ago. It it was not <laughs> so heavy. And this is Arnold, and as you can see, for example, you have all the Arnold properties uh, that we are used, uh, all, all the parameters that uh, we, we are used uh, from the previous system. Okay, so if, if we compare Arnold and Karma, it's the same. So, yeah, there are some uh, stuff that I didn't uh, shade in, in Karma. Okay, and the other big thing is these variations. So just right click and change variation of the asset when you when you do rendering. So I, I'm joking, but it really, it really looks like uh, you're working in uh, cycles in Blender. Like you can move stuff during the rendering. Okay, so we have uh, on this asset, we have uh, three uh, 
three uh, variations, and these variations can be geometry or material or both. Okay. Yeah. So I'm hearing. Okay. So this is the third one, and as you can see, there are some lights involved in the story. You can also put some volumes if you want to have uh, them I inside the asset. What, whatever, uh, whatever you want, you can put inside the asset. Okay. So these are some. Renders. Uh, I think these renders are Arnold. And the great thing is, lights that uh, that we created work in both renderers, and they behave abs absolutely the same. So there is no difference in intensities. Okay, so that's for us. That is really big thing. Okay. And. Um, on this project, uh, because we have school, we have a lot of uh, a lot of students at our school. Uh, we involved them in the project, and they were creating um, a lot of assets. And these were some of the renders they did for the assets. So these trees have two variants: one is uh, uh, summer, one is winter. And this is the scene they created in school. So. Uh, they they basically learned how to pack assets uh, inside Solaris, and they learned how to do scene assembly. I will show you the graph of that scene later. And basically, what is the difference? How does this work? So if you look uh, to the left, there is outliner. So there is actual outliner in Houdini now, uh, like in Maya. Uh, so basically, you can take you can take a group. And you can transform it. So that's something that previously in Houdini you you would have to be TD in order to do that. Okay. So what we are targeting up there, the path is I exactly that group. And here I'm animating inside Solaris. I would not recommend it maybe for lights, but yeah, you can do it. So I'm animating like the main group and the group for this crane and what are uh, what uh, you see here i want to write uh, i want to write that as usd and what you see here is usd file this is ascii usd file and what you see here i'm writing only okay this group moves there and these are these are the transformations and there is for the other group so i'm not writing any geometry i'm i'm just writing edits that I did. And I can't stress enough how important this is. Because on, on Moon Knight, what we had, uh, we had, for example, environment uh, layout that uh, was changing a bit to the shots. And for e each of these environment layouts, we were exporting Alembics, and they, they were very heavy. And right now, if, if we were to do that kind of project, we would be exporting USDs in which there will be information. This this pillar moves there. This pillar moves there, and that's it. So if you don't touch anything, it it would be empty file. Okay. So you are writing only the difference. Uh, so on this project, we were crazy enough basically to rig this USD asset. And the great thing about Houdini is you can manipulate USD geometry natively. So uh, this is Kinefix rig. So basically, what I'm doing is I'm I'm uh, actually uh, manipulating this USD data. I'm not converting it uh, to Houdini geometry. I'm working di directly with USD geometry. Uh, back then, I was trying to do that rig in Maya, but back then uh, there was no uh, no way to do uh, to constrain, for example, USD geometry. Now I think there is a way. And basically, that for me, that meant I couldn't rig these mechanical assets. So that's why we decided to, to create rig like this. And this is, uh, this is one test for these uh, rigs. And these are some uh, like animatic shots from that project. So yeah, what we, in the end, what we created also for these hits on the water uh, FX artists would get them, and if they want, they could scatter some uh, splashes that they already generated and finish the job. So don't complicate it. Okay. And uh, so these were uh, my like, my main thing. Mechanical characters was solved, and um, the other thing, uh, mechanical 
assets. And the other thing uh, about the characters, uh, so what we are doing, we are animating characters in Maya, and uh, we are exporting these uh, characters as a Lambic, and there is only one small step, it's not too scary. Uh, so what we are doing, we are manipulating uh, names of the objects that are coming fr from Maya because of the namespaces. We are trying to get rid of, uh, of namespaces in order to have, uh, so you see characters, name of the character, and then it goes uh, all, all the asset data for the character. Uh, so that's, that was the purpose of this script. And this is like a tool that I created for animators with which they can, they can plug camera, they can plug um, uh, animation data. And on the third one, there was like, if they have any FX uh, proxies, and they, they export that as USD. And that USD, uh, so yeah, before the next step, uh, if you want to do this kind of stuff, this guy, uh, all of his lectures are really useful. And basically, I was just copying what he did. Uh, basically, he explained. He also, I think on GitHub, uh, he also published some of, of the stuff that they did. Uh, so you can grab it and test it. But their good advice from them was, uh, always have scene hierarchy that would be like uh, like uh, some meta groups like characters uh, vehicles cameras environments so you will always have that in scene almost always and all characters all characters have names and uh, after the name there is uh, that is the name of the actual asset in shotgun so basically i could uh, for example our coordinators or me uh, for the sequence, we can create this kind of file and say, okay, this is what we have in the scenes for each of the shots. And then, uh, then, yeah, so let's, let's go back. Okay, why this is important? For example, we have a scene in which we have one bear. Now, one currently ongoing project, we have one bear. There was one animator that had five bears in the scene. So basically he was, copying and hiding bears because he didn't like his animations and then he would unhide some that he likes. Uh, we did it this way in order to prevent this kind of stuff from happening ever again. So ideally what you want is basically you have this like XML or JSON file uh, and that JSON file when animator opens the scene he will have this kind of hierarchy in Maya and he will have all of these characters referenced uh, in these groups and then he can move them. So that's ideally. Okay, and this is a example shot from the project. So that uh, guy, Nicola, he did uh, all of these characters. Uh, Dragon did uh, water simulations. It's a bit short. Let's see. Okay. Yeah, so everything worked. Okay, so this is sim and this is final render. And I was not expecting uh, to see this final render, but what Dragon did, because he, in, in his FX scene, he has all stuff loaded. Uh, so he just rendered it all together and it was like 20 minutes frame in Karma. So we, we were really not expecting that. It's a little bit noisy, but okay. So how how our system works? Uh, we have one node. It's not too complicated. Basically, it's Python node inside Solaris, uh, and basically, according to that uh, XML file, it loads uh, all of these meta categor categories. So you have this is our environment asset, and it it is in the proper place in 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 the hierarchy yeah so this is our environment i i'm hiding it now so this is our uh, ship asset right now it is in the zero uh, in the center of the scene and these are the characters so you see all of the characters are also on zero so they are stuck uh, on top one on top of the other so the right one is the captain, the other are the sailors. And for the sailors, uh, 
what is really easy to do is to have variants for different faces, for different uh, like uh, clothing, and basically uh, just pass that information, for example, from animation to to look development. And this step, so this is like regular Solaris node. It's called the file or sub layer. So what I'm doing in this step, uh, did I trim this video? Okay, yeah. I'm loading this animation USD. And that animation USD has only information about geometric caches, nothing else. And you can see now, yeah, maybe. Okay. Yeah, frame selection. <laughs> okay, so I'm trying to frame these guys. Um, this ship is really off off the center of the scene. Yeah, sometimes you need to adjust clipping planes in in Houdini. Okay, so basically you can see here that all of these sailors now. Uh, got in their proper places so that what what animation usd is doing is doing exactly that is just moving them uh in 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 the scene but because they are characters basically that is geometry cache not uh, not only translation okay so what yeah and here on the ship i'm changing uh, uh, variant so now it's damaged so it's that easy okay and this uh, what you see behind is the whole environment and i i limited the number of polys in viewport but now you will see so i switched to karma and did i trim this okay we will wait for one minute <laughs> Okay, yeah, so because of the water displacement, it might take uh, some time uh, to to start. Okay, yeah, any questions while we wait for this? Okay, so this is, it started, and you see, for example, in render you have like selection highlighting, I usually turn that off. I don't like to move stuff during the render, but this is this is the look without any lights. So this is some default light, but I will just reconnect it to to the to the. So here you have the lights. You have that set variant. It's it's double, but it doesn't matter. So. Uh, you see that there is connection between your assets being loaded, your assets being, for example, transformed, manipulated, and then de rendering it itself. So uh, you can uh, you can see uh, connections between these. Okay, is this the end of the video? No. Okay, so this is uh, with the lights, with FX layers for for effects. Also, it's very easy. So our effects, uh, our effects artist would just export his effects as USD, and because he's referencing a bunch of uh, volume uh, VDBs, that file would be r very light. It would just uh, reference these VDBs inside of it, and. I really, uh, I I gave uh, to some people to play with this scene, you know, <laughs> and we got a lot of camera angles that we didn't anticipate because it's very interactive. Okay, five minutes. Okay, I'll be fast. Okay, yeah. So, uh, to let let's say to compare a little bit. So our traditional way of doing uh, like render setup, for example, render layers or render render passes, uh, would be. Uh, we had some scripts uh, that would automatically create render passes that we want. So we have that uh, in Maya, we have that in Houdini. And uh, these scripts, you have to basically be TD that knows uh, something about Python in Maya in order to do that. Uh, it's the same thing. It's the same thing uh, in Houdini with ROPS. Basically, you have to write Python script that would uh, populate these things. And basically, it's not that easy. And th the only like good side about drops in Houdini is you have node for every render layer. Layer it's a little bit uh, clearer, uh, like visually. Okay. And yeah. Okay. 
Okay, and what is foggy in ROPS? In Houdini, for example, a list of objects that's being rendered can look like this. So you have to go back in the object level and find what are the objects being rendered. We have some conventions like uh, uh, highlight these nodes in green, put uh, some uh, suffix like uh, render or something like that. But it can be a lot of back and forth between uh, different uh, contexts. While in Solaris, it looks like this. So this is that Christmas scene. So up there are the assets that are being loaded, uh, transformed, and so on. So first step is assets. Second step is uh, like adding some general snow. And w what is good thing, we can just, uh, for example, for that snow, uh, we could just take whatever assets we have, uh, run it through like procedural snow uh, system, and then create another object that will be snow. So that's some somewhere here. Then we have some lights, and then these red things you see here are different render layers. And for example, somebody who was working in Max uh, uh, could not get bend his uh, head around this. But uh, somebody who, is, who was working in Nuke, like me, for, for a long time, this is very clear, you know, like it's very familiar. Uh, the way you work in Nuke is exactly like this, also Katana, uh, Clarice, okay? Uh, so basically, you, you see connections between your objects, uh, your, the things you set, everything is documented as a node. And that is, uh, if you want to copy that from one scene to another, you just copy nodes from one scene to another. You don't have to write Python script in order to, to do that. Okay. And yeah, so uh, what we did uh, for uh, back at the time, uh, uh, we didn't. Uh, so, for example, in Karma, you have uh, in Karma uh, render drop, uh, render this in this Karma render node you have a bunch of uh, AOVs that you can uh, turn on and off. Uh, while uh, in Arnold, there was nothing like this, but I'm sure uh, it will be uh, what, I, what I saw on the forums. But what we did, we created a kind of uh, HDA that would do that. And the good thing is uh, our Houdini artists know how to use HDA. They know how to open digital assets if they need to change something. They don't have to code in order to do that. So we have node that would create render layers, uh, render passes that we want, and that fits to the standards of our studio. And everyone knows how to do that, okay? So that is uh, that is that HDA. And this is, uh, yeah, this is the last slide. Okay, uh, so on this project what we did we have one sequence that is like 20 shots of uh, train station uh, same assets different cameras so uh, we did uh, like created the branches and each one of these branches uh, of these branches are different shots and basically uh, we have as you can see we have two light setups and it works you have it all in one scene and now um, there was good presentation on SIGGRAPH from RISE. Uh, they, they did it as well. And uh, Swiss also did it. We just copied from them. And basically, this is uh, when you adopt this kind of, of working, uh, you could light uh, like 20 shots and render them uh, really fast. So there is no, uh, you're like saving a lot of time with this. Okay. And yeah, the things that we look forward is uh, yeah, Material X support in different renderers. And uh, we are really happy that, uh, for example, our artists could create uh, asset in Maya, uh, create materials, export that as USD, and then we ship that asset uh, from uh, to uh, Houdini, Clarice, or, or, or wherever. And we hope that clients will not send us locators in future, that they will just send us USD files and basically we will speak with the same language. Okay. Uh, USD plugin in Unreal, uh, that will be like really big thing uh, because all of the stuff that we are uh, working uh, on in, in our applications, imagine that on one click you can export it to Unreal and that all materials would work because they're all PBR materials. They should all behave in the same way. Okay, so uh, that's 
that's for Unreal. And yeah, we are really happy for uh, Karma updates. Karma XP actually saved us uh, on, on the current project. Uh, we, we had renders that were taking days and then these renders on Karma XP were taking night on, on one machine. So it's really it really helped us speed production cycle. Okay, and yeah, uh, as you saw, uh, all of these applications like uh, Maya and Blender are updating the, their USD plugins. So basically it's happening, or like standardization between uh, different vendors is happening. Okay, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Wally, for that insight. Uh, so, I think we have some time for at least a couple of questions. Uh, anybody has any? I can be the mic guy and run through up and down and hand you the mic. Yeah, sure. So, um, it's not directly uh, related to the presentation itself, but I wanted to ask um, what are sort of the steps uh, to making uh, fire and smoke effects? Um, and animating them. <laughs> I would suggest uh, side the Fix YouTube channel. There is a lot of, uh, if you go to there, there is uh, on the site, there is like a whole section called learning paths. So if you know anything in Houdini, uh, first you should know a little bit of uh, like modeling uh, in, in SOPS, but when you go over that, uh, in learning paths, there is like a list of tutorials that would help you like learn how to do pyro. And it's really, the way it is arranged is really good for, for somebody that who is starting. And on YouTube also you have like playlists and there is a bunch of like uh, playlists that are like related with, uh, for example, pyro or, or fur or anything like that. Cool, thank you. Hi, so uh, I have a question re regarding USD files in general, no, not in general, but uh, are you uh, transferring only the, the differences between the yep. versions? So you are not exporting the whole geometry and stuff like that? W when you export assets like model, you export whole geometry. When you export uh, flip mesh, you export whole model. But when you, for example, you are doing layout and you want to export the things that you did, you are just exporting offsets. And that is really beneficial. Yeah. Thank you. You load uh, both the geometry asset and the the movement asset. Yeah, that it. was the that was the tricky part. So what guys from Swiss International explained to us is basically if you just load this animation uh, USD and if it is just uh, transforming uh, some stuff like on my boat, which is mechanical asset, you will get nothing. So you will get groups in Outliner, but uh, it doesn't know what he should move. Uh, so basically uh, you would need to load these assets first and then apply animation uh, layer USD and that is what we are doing with that uh, like uh, s scene load or whatever we call that node. So just one follow up to uh, continue where Milos said before. So uh, w uh, first you transfer the geometry. So that uh, essentially uh, replaces the need for both the FBX and the uh, ABC Alembic files. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. then you just update version update uh, through uh, USD uh, animation uh, yeah, USD. yeah later yeah yeah, yeah yeah great thanks yeah yeah <laughs> so Bole, is every project from now full USD pipe or uh, we'll see <laughs> we have some that are left over but what's missing is there a big piece missing of the puzzle to switching completely to USD or uh, the only thing uh, right now that we are keeping our eyes on is, uh, for example, because we are doing all animations in Maya, uh, we are like uh, following what's happening uh, in uh, Maya USD plugin. So we would uh, skip that step of uh, digesting these alembics uh, for the characters from Maya and then 
exporting them as USD, basically, preferably that should be done in Maya, not not in Houdini. So one step less. And there is like we are now waiting for some of the like renderers to to get uh, to get into uh, game. You know, like uh, for example, for Arnold. Uh, we are we are, we implemented this mid project and there was some stuff that came uh, when while we while we were doing uh, like renders that take uh, three weeks Arnold got updates and all of these updates were like ah uh, for me they were like this this is th the thing we need <laughs> but we cannot update it uh, in, in during the renders so yeah I think it will happen it's just uh, uh, it takes a little bit of time. Okay, last one. Um, what's the advantage compared to Katana apart from the price? Are there any? Uh, yeah, uh, there is one guy uh, who, who is working with us, uh, who is uh, advocating Clarice, and I was working uh, on one project in Clarice, and Honestly, that's the worst documentation for for Python that I saw. So uh, that that's why uh, we basically advantage is you have one up one application. So if you are one man band uh, or you are small studio, it's really uh, as as much as possible keep everything in in few applications and this basically. I, d I don't see for us need to, to use Katana or Clarice uh, because of Solaris. Thank you, boy. Can we get one more round of applause? <laughs> yes.